Hey folks, in today's episode of Code Club, I'm finally going to build out a visual with you to display the level of droughtiness around the world, uh, looking at the amount of precipitation for the past 30 days relative to that same window over the life of uh, those weather stations in those different regions. Looking here in Visual Studio Code, VS Code, you can call it, um, I read in my precipitation data. Again, this is the amount of precipitation for the past 30 days. Uh, the station data then tells us what stations belong to each region. I'm thinking of each region as a um, whole number latitude and longitude. So if your latitude was like 30.45, it's going to be 30. Okay, And we pulled these stations together again because our eyes can't perceive that small scale difference. So ultimately what we do is we average the amount of precipitation over that 30 day window for all the weather stations within the same region. And you can see here, that's what's happening, right? We join our precipitation and station data together. We filter to get rid of uh, the first year um, and the last year because in some of these weather stations, they perhaps started mid-year, ended mid-year. Um, but we want to make sure that we do get the data that we have the year 2022 for. Like I said, we group by our latitude and longitude, and then we summarize to get the mean of the precipitation, to get the mean amount of precipitation for each whole number, latitude, and longitude. In the last episode, we refactored this code, of course, to go ahead and group by latitude and longitude, and then to calculate the z-score for each combination of latitude and longitude. The z-score is an observation minus the mean, and that difference divided by the standard deviation. So the z-score is the number of standard deviations away from the mean that your data represents. So I want to know for 2022, you know, the last 30 days of um, precipitation, how does that compare uh, where I am to the last 130 years worth of data, right? So for that 130 years worth of data, say, I can calculate a mean and a standard deviation, and then I can see where does my observation fall in that distribution? Again, that's the z-score that we're generating here. And then I go ahead and filter the data to only look at those regions where we have at least 50 years worth of data and where I have the year 2022 because I want to plot the 2022 data. So we're ready to do all that plotting. I'm gonna go ahead and fire up a terminal here in uh, VS Code and I'll activate my environment. So I'll do conda activate drought and start R, and I'm gonna go ahead and load all this and we'll see what we get. So we see that there's about 3,300 uh, different latitude and longitude combinations. And so again, we have latitude, longitude, and our z-score. And so now what we wanna do is convert this data frame into a visual. And so what we can do um, is I'm gonna add this to the overall pipeline. I will pipe this into ggplot. So the data coming through the pipeline will be what's getting plotted. I'll then use the AES function. It feels like it's been a long time since I've made a plot here on Code Club. So the aesthetics we're gonna use are X, Y, and then fill. And the X, again, is going to be the position, you can think around uh, the, the equator, <laughs> uh, so to speak. And so that is going to be the longitude, I think. Uh, we'll see pretty quickly if we're wrong. Uh, I don't do a lot of GIS stuff, so it's very possible that I can get these things flipped. And then latitude uh, is the elevation or the, the position relative to the equator north-south. I think I've got this right. I shouldn't second guess myself so much. And then the fill is going to be our z-score. So z underscore score. And then we could do a geom raster, which is a function that we've used in the past to plot temperature anomalies. So we get this beautiful map. Um, we can see the, you know, the basics of the United States Alaska, Hawaii out here, Australia comes in pretty well, um, and Europe and Asia um, and Africa and South America are there, but they're not as densely seeded with data. So um, that's just the way it is. Again, the data I'm getting is coming from NOAA, which, a, which is a US-based agency. I suspect there's perhaps other databases out there that we could get data from that has more data for Europe, Asia, Africa, um, and South America. I am getting a warning message that raster pixels are placed at horizontal intervals and will be shifted. Um, and so, and I also get for the vertical. So it advises that we should consider using geom tile instead. And again, that's because perhaps we don't have a full grid's worth of data. So I'm gonna simply change geom raster to geom tile. And you might be familiar with geom tile if you've ever made a heat map. 
So again, a heat map um, is, is basically what we're making, right? Uh, with a heat map though, like when I typically think of its use with like genomics, uh, perhaps on the x-axis we'd have different treatments and on the y-axis uh, we have different genes. And then the, the cells are rectangles that are then gonna be colored relative to like their gene expression or something like that. So maybe you've never thought of a heat map as a plot with an x and y axis, but it certainly is. So here we are with our geome tile version. It looks a lot like what we saw for uh, geome raster. Um, I feel like some of these continents that we don't have as much data for um, perhaps looks a little bit more sparse than it did before, but um, we'll run with geome tile. One thing I wanna make sure that we do is to ensure that the spacing on the x-axis for the longitude is the same as the spacing on the y-axis for the latitude. One of the things I see uh, is that the spacing for the latitude here on the y-axis, that one of these spaces between major grid lines is about 50 degrees, whereas on the longitude, it's 100 degrees. So we need these spacings to be the same so that a degree on the x-axis <laughs> is the same size as a degree on the y-axis. So I can add to this then uh, chord fixed. So this gives us perhaps a little bit more of a squished view of our map, but again, it is more faithful so that, you know, this spacing here uh, between zero and 50 on longitude on the y x axis is the same as the size on the y axis between zero and 50. The next thing I want to turn my attention to is the fill color that we're using to depict the level of droughtiness, the z-scores, right? And so if you look at the scale over here on the right side, you'll see that it's a monotonic change starting at like a dark blue, almost black, going to a light blue. What I'd rather have is perhaps to have blue go to white to red. So we'll use a scale fill gradient two. So I'll go ahead and add scale fill gradient two. And then this pop-up is very helpful uh, to tell me uh, the different options. I'm going to flip the colors so it gives red, a muted red as the low, and a muted blue as the high. I'm actually gonna flip that. Why don't we try having like a yellow as being the low and a green being the high, so like wet. I think of green as being like lush growth green, right? Um, and then, you know, maybe like a red um, or yellow as being dry. I don't wanna use red and green because some people can't differentiate between those two colors. So maybe I'll go from yellow to white to green. And let's see what that looks like. So we'll do low, equals yellow, and we'll then do mid equals white, and then high equals green, and then we'll do midpoint uh, as zero. Uh, so midpoint equals zero is the default, and mid equals white is also the default. I like to leave those in here with my arguments to make it crystal clear to myself when I'm reading back through this later, and anybody that looks at it later, uh, what I was using for my different colors. So now we've got our color gradient going from green at the wettest to yellow at the lightest, going through zero being white. Uh, I feel like these colors just get really washed out. So instead of me trying to pick pairs of colors that will work well together and will be friendly to people who have red green color deficiency. Um, I'm going to use the great tool colorbrewer2.org. Uh, this is a website that is really designed for people doing uh, GIS cartography type of data visualizations. And what I can do is I can put in the number of data classes, three up to nine. I don't know why they have 10, 11, or 12. Who knows? Um, diverging, sequential, qualitative. So sequential would be kind of that monotonic change. Diverging would be to have, say, white or a light color in the middle like we have. And then qualitative would be, say, we've got like three or four or five different categories and we want to give each color, each category a different color. Again, I've got diverging and I want something that's going to be colorblind safe. And so I think this first option actually works really well where we have this uh, middle kind of grayish color that you can see here. It's not quite white. Um, and the hex code is F5, F5, F5. So I'm gonna use this brownish color for dry conditions and the greener color for uh, more moist conditions. I'll go ahead and click on export and we'll then go ahead and um, grab these hex codes. There is a R package for Color Brewer called R Color Brewer. I find that it's uh, not really what I wanna mess with. It's easier for me to grab these hex codes and put them where I want them in my R script. So that's what I'll do. So we'll come in here and I'll just plop these here for now. And I think this first one was the low that I wanna use. 
This F5, F5, F5 is the uh, whitish, grayish color that I want to use. And then this um, 5AB, 4AC, I think was the greenish color that I'd like to use. And we'll go ahead and regenerate the figure. And because so many of the observations are right around zero, it's totally washed out. So now what I want to do is go ahead and change the color of my background to be black so that we can then see everything in more stark contrast. So let's do that by going and modifying the arguments within the theme function. So I'll then do plot dot background equals element fill or rect, right? And then the fill for that is going to be black. And then we'll also do panel dot background element rect fill equals black. So I know I also want to turn off those grid lines. So I'll do panel dot grid equals element blank which will again get rid of those lines. So with this black background and no uh, grid lines, it does look um, a bit more attractive, uh, easier to kind of see the individual squares and pixels that we're plotting. The problem that I'm gonna come back to though is the scale of the colors. There's not a lot of variation in the colors that we have. And as I look at the Z-score scale, I see it goes up to 7.5. And so this means that there's a data point in here somewhere that has seven and a half standard deviations outside of the normal. And so that's probably a problem in the data or it's really an outlier, right? And I can't visually look at it, look at this and see where that is. Maybe that's like right there, um, I don't know. So I think what I'll do instead is figure out what is the bottom range? What is the lowest value? And then I'll I'll go kind of the, the positive of that, right? And, and I'll probably end up hard coding this um, so out of curiosity, let's come back in here after the select before the ggplot and do summarize and I'll do min equals min on z score. And then we'll also do max being the max on z score. And so, yeah, I see that the minimum value is negative 2.5 basically. And the max is like 7.8. I think what I will do is go ahead and turn everything that's less than negative two or greater than positive two, I'm gonna set that to those values so that then my legend has the maximum green and brown color, or whatever these colors are at those two values. And then I'll modify the label on the scale to indicate that, okay? So we'll go ahead and remove this. And we'll also then um, go ahead and in here where I have my select and I'll do mutate uh, z-score equals if else z score greater than uh, two, then I want it to be two. Otherwise I'm gonna use z score. And then we'll also have, um, we'll repeat this. And if it's less than negative two, then we'll make that negative two. I probably could have done this with a case when statement, but eh, whatever. And so we'll pipe that in. This looks a lot better than what we just had where the colors were really muted because again, we had really broad scale. And so now what we see is that we have two being the upper end and negative two being at the bottom end. And those are the darker colors. Again, I think it's kind of hard to see what's going on um, in Europe, Africa, Asia, uh, Australia, and South America because there's just not a lot of data there. Um, I'm not totally sold that I wanna only focus on the United States because I know I have a lot of people watching this. Um, from other places in the world. So I don't wanna to totally exclude you. But I think the colors here look pretty good and I'm happy with that. Now what I wanna do is turn my attention to looking at the legend uh, so I can make it clear that this color green is for things greater than two and this color brown is for things less than negative two. So back in here, my scale fill gradient two, I'm gonna go ahead and add breaks. Uh, and to this, we'll give it a vector. And so we'll say minus two, minus one, zero, one, and two. And then my labels uh, will then do, so I'll do less than negative two, uh, negative one, zero, one, uh, and then greater than two. I don't know that I need quotes around negative one, zero, and one. I'm gonna include them just to make all these labels consistent. Oh, and I misspelled labels, so that should be ELS. So this gets us our labels to be how we wanted them. I'm now going to use the theme function to go ahead and remove the title. I also wanna make the background of my legend black so that we can see the colors in the same context that we'll see it in the plot. And so then I'll need to flick my colors of the text to be white. 
And so again, we'll do all that here in the theme function. And so we can then do legend.background equals element. Uh, I'm going to do blank because that will make it a transparent background. So it'll be the same color as the background. And then we'll do legend.text equals um, element text. And then we'll do color equals, and I'm going to use this gray color, F5s, and that'll be good. And I need to get rid of the title. So here up in scale fill gradient, I'll do name equals null. So this looks, this is the legend here is looking better. One thing that I'll do is I'm going to move my legend to be down here in kind of the, the South Pacific because there's not much data over here. And if all the data is over here in North America, then I have to keep scanning back and forth uh, to interpret the colors, right? So if I put the legend down here in the South Pacific, I'll have it closer to where most of the data are. So let's go ahead and do that. And we can do that with legend.position. And to that, I can give it a vector, 140. And on the Y, let's try zero. And so it disappeared. And I'm remembering that this is not the actual X and Y positions, but it's a relative positioning in the plot, right? So if I put uh, zero, zero, then it puts it in the lower left corner, right? So maybe I'm gonna go in, let's say 10%. So we'll do 0 0.1 and then we'll do 0 0.3. So let's maybe move it over to the right and down a bit. And so again, I'll do 0.2 and then 0.2. So I think that's a pretty good position on the legend. Uh, again, it always takes a little bit of tweaking to move things and get them exactly where we want them. I do wanna go ahead and get rid of these degrees, um, latitude and longitude, because I don't think they're super meaningful to most people. So again, we can do that here in the theme function where I can then add axis.text equals element blank. And so that then gets rid of that text on the X and Y axis indicating the latitude and longitude. So interpreting this figure and looking at the United States in particular for the last month, and again, I downloaded the data at the um, kind of beginning part of October. So this is basically September into the beginning of October when I got the data. You'll see that kind of the Midwest, Southern Midwest was pretty dry. Um, and I think this fall has been pretty dry for where I am, kind of up here uh, in Michigan, whereas it looks like kind of the southwest for the United States has been pretty wet. Um, and that's after, you know, a pretty severe drought for the past year. Um, over in Europe, I know they had a lot of drought. It's kind of hard to see what's going on and whether or not um, they're still in drought conditions. It kind of looks like down and through here, uh, we see some more of the, the brownish points indicating droughtiness. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this figure into a directory that I don't think I have a figures directory yet in here. So maybe I'll go ahead and open up another bash shell. And if we look in um, in the directory, yep, we don't have a figures directory. So I'll do mkdir figures. And then in ggsave, I'll go ahead and save that to figures forward slash world drought dot png so looking at the png i see that we've got these white borders on the figure so i think we could remove that border by coming back to plot background and then adding color equals black and that sure enough got rid of the border on the top and bottom one thing i think we could also do is make the aspect ratio of the figure to be two to one so here we could do width equals eight height equals four. So this gives us a better depiction of the aspect ratio of the world, uh, again, with latitude and longitude. This legend position is kind of bugging me. I think what I'm gonna do is go ahead and make it horizontal and put it down towards the bottom. So we can do that with legend.direction equals horizontal. And so now we've got a horizontal act legend. Let's go ahead and move that down a bit. And we'll do that with uh, the Y. So uh, I'll go ahead and put that at zero. So I can make that legend a little bit uh, thinner by doing legend.key uh, height and give it the unit function. I'll do 0 0.25 uh, CM centimeters. And that looks pretty good. The last thing I wanna do is go ahead and build in uh, some titles. So we'll go ahead and use the labs function and we'll do uh, title equals amount of precipitation for, um, and we'll do start <laughs> to 
end. And then I'll do subtitle and I'll say standardized uh, Z scores for at least the past 50 years. And then for my caption, uh, this will be something at the bottom of the plot. I'll go ahead and do uh, precipitation data collected from GHCN daily data at NOAA. Fix this mis misspelling here. Of course, all my text is black, so I need to go ahead and change that. And so we'll go ahead and do um, plot.title element text color equals, uh, let's use that F5, right? We'll use this gray color. And then we also want to do the subtitle, plot subtitle, plot dot subtitle, and then plot dot caption. Do the same thing. That looks pretty good. I think I want my title title to be a bit larger. And so let's go ahead and add to plot dot title, do size 18. I think that size looks pretty good. I now need to add the start and end values. And we'll come back up. And I'm going to say start, and we'll do today. Um, and so up, and it doesn't know what today is because it doesn't have Lubridate. So we'll do library Lubridate. And while I'm up here, also do library glue. Uh, and we'll go ahead and load these two packages. So now we have start. And so start is that. Um, and so that's actually the end, right? So this should be end, and then start should be. Um, end minus 30, right? So let's put that after. And so we now have end and start. So to get it in a good format, we can go ahead and use the format function on today, and then we can give it a string of the format we want. So if I do percent B, capital B, that will be the full spelled out name of the month. And then percent D will be the day of the month. And then percent capital Y will be the year. And then for the start, I'm going to grab the same thing I had for end, except I'll do today minus 30. And so now if we run end and start, end and start look good. I can now plug those into my uh, title. And we'll then do uh, that in curly braces, end in curly braces. And I need to go ahead and wrap this in the glue function uh, so that we can insert those values. So that looks pretty good. I think one thing I'll change is to leave out the year. I think if we're doing it from today going back, it'll be pretty obvious what year it is. So let's go back up to our format. I'm going to leave out that percent %y and this percent %y. And we'll go ahead and rerun everything and see what it looks like. Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. I'm generally pretty happy with the appearance of this figure. We have this saved as a nice PNG. In the next episode, we'll see how we can get that up onto GitHub and get it to process every day. So before we finish, I'm going to go ahead and save my R script, and then I'm going to update my snake file. And so we'll then do rule uh, plot drought by region, and we'll then do input will be what? Oh, I need a colon at the end of this line. Input will be my R script which I will call, um, it'll be in code, and it'll be plot uh, drought by region dot r, and I misspelled region, of course, because that's what I do. Uh, and then the data are gonna be the two uh, files that we got back here. So I'm gonna copy these lines, paste them in here, and then lift out uh, the names of the files. So this is going to be the PRCP data, and then we'll also have the station data, which again, we can clean this up a little bit and that looks good. And then the output uh, will be in figures forward slash uh, world drought.png. That needs to be in quotes. Drought needs a T. Good. And then we'll go ahead and do uh, the shell command. So I'll copy and paste this down. I find that copying and pasting is a lot easier to do than retyping things because as you see, as I type, I make a lot of mistakes. Anyway, so this will then go ahead and generate that. 
One thing I need is to rename the name of my R script to this. So I'm going to copy that and then I'm going to rename it with git. So I'll do git mv um, code merge weather stations R to that, run that. And so now we see that we've got plot drought data there, right? I also want to make this executable. So I'll copy that and do chmod plus x on that. Cool. And then I can do code uh, plot drought by region. This runs, hopefully no problems. And then we can, of course, add that as a target, this figures uh, world drought to our input, um, to our targets, right? I'm going to go ahead and test this with snakemake. So I'll do snakemake hyphen hyphen dry uh, run. And then I'll plop in the name of the figure to make sure everything works well. Up oh, and I'm not actually in uh, my conda environment right now. So I'll do conda activate drought, rerun that. Hopefully everything works well. Up, oh, it's saying I'm missing a comma perhaps on line 84. That's certainly possible. Uh, maybe you noticed that. Yeah, I'm missing a couple commas, right? So there and there. I'll go ahead and save that and rerun it. This is why we test things out. Good. That's all present and accounted for. And uh, it says nothing to be done. So I'm going to go ahead and force it, right? And so if I do hyphen hyphen force, great. So yep, there is uh, that that works. So now I'm going to go ahead and run it. And I'll do it with one processor. So I'll do hyphen C one. Wonderful. And then I of course, I can make sure that my plot looks the way it's supposed to. And that looks great. I'm pretty happy with that. Great. So now I can do get status. So I see that there's a rplots.pdf that is being untracked. Um, I don't actually want to track that because that's kind of a, a side effect of running ggplot in this type of environment. So I'm going to go into my git ignore file and I will add to this rplots.pdf. Save that. And now if I do get status again, it's no longer un saying it's untracked uh, that rplots.pdf, but it has modified the get ignore. I'm going to go ahead and get add um, all the things. So now I'll go ahead, uh, let's do get status, get commit, and we'll say uh, generate visual of drought across the world, world, get push. And now that will be up on GitHub, which is exactly where we want it to be because in the next episode, what I'm going to do is see how we can use GitHub Actions to rerun this entire pipeline every night to get a fresh look at uh, the droughtiness of the world. So that you don't miss that exciting episode, please, please, please make sure that you've subscribed to the channel. You give this episode a thumbs up. Tell all your friends about the cool stuff we're doing over here on Code Club, and we'll see you next time.